Millions of years before humankind, the planet was ruled by massive creatures, titans who fed off radiation then abundant on Earth's surface. When the earliest human tribes rose, they built their homes near benevolent titans, who protected them against those more hostile. Cultures formed around these titans, each worshipping their own as deities. For a long time, humanity and Titan lived symbiotically. Some ancient people may have even developed telepathic communication with them. But as is humanity's way, some hoped to control these colossal beasts as tools for war. And when Titans rebelled, it became a war between man and monster. Once a massive cataclysm triggered the Ice Age, the Titans went into hibernation. The surviving pockets of civilization forgot their connections with these creatures, and memories turned into myth, including one of a great Titan who rose to the top of the primordial ecosystem. Godzilla, who protected humanity time and again, including at least one legendary battle with the three-headed dragon, King Ghidorah. As Earth's surface became humanity's domain and radiation subsided, Titans moved inward, to a hidden world beneath our own, powered by radiation from the core. But there are passageways to that world, including one on a place called Skull Island, and sometimes monsters come out of those passageways. For thousands of years, the Iwi natives of the island lived in fear of those monsters, until one day, something else comes out of the gateway, colossal apes who protect the natives. But over time, most of their protectors fall, and by the 20th century, only one remains, the one they call Kong, king of the island. In 1944, the island receives its first visitors from the outside world, Hank Marlowe and Gunpei Ikari, American and Japanese pilots on opposite sides of the war. That quickly changes after they crash and come face to face with a giant ape. They soon learn he is not a threat, but there are many things on the island which are, and despite the uniforms which say the pilots are enemies, they quickly become friends in a shared fight for survival. And Skull Island is not the only place where monsters reside. In fact, in 1952, Lieutenant Lee Shaw will meet a dragon in the Philippines. He's assigned to escort Japanese scientist Keiko Mura there to investigate after the discovery of airborne radioisotopes. They're off to a rocky start when he expects Dr. Mura to be a man, and she makes some snap judgments of her own. But it's not long before they see and respect each other's capability. And soon, they are joined by a third, Billy Randa, a Navy vet on a crusade for the truth. Judging by Dr. Mura's equipment, he can tell they're both after the same truth, to prove monsters real. He provides some insight. They won't find monsters with a Geiger counter. He recommends looking to folklore. The people here talk of a dragon which carves a path of fire across the sky. Or maybe, he suggests, a path of ionizing radiation. They follow that radiation to an old ship, the USS Lawton, a ship Billy sailed on as part of the US Navy. The official story is that it was sunk by an enemy attack in 43. But as its sole survivor, Billy knows the truth. They were taken down by a dragon. Ever since, it's been his life's mission to prove it. And today, he does because while they're investigating the ship, the Ion Dragon attacks. With Lee's help, they survive the encounter. Two years later, Lee convinces the scientists that they need more funding if they want Monarch to be more than just a small monster hunting club. For that funding, Lee turns to the US military and requests 150 pounds of uranium to attract a titan. It takes convincing, but a dinosaur-sized footprint in Indonesia does the job. Though Bill and Keiko quickly learn, the military doesn't share their thirst for knowledge. The scientists want to study the ancient creatures, while the military wants to destroy them before they become a threat. At Bikini Atoll, they do draw out the titan, a lizard they'll one day call Godzilla. And once he appears, they blow him up. The Titan is presumed dead, but Monarch does get the blank check they hoped for, because now the military is afraid. What if there are others out there like that big lizard? And what if the next one shows up in a major city? The following year, 
Lee brings Keiko to the American Defense Industry Federation Ball. To her, it's an unfortunate part of the job, the unpleasant duty to shake hands with those who fund her mission, the same people who sneer at her and excuse her Japanese heritage by reassuring that she's one of the good ones. But somehow, Lee makes her forget about it all. They dance. When the others stare, they dance closer. And when they stand at the elevator, hoping to spend time alone in Lee's room, fate intervenes. An urgent message from Bill about off-the-chart radiation readings in Japan. Of course, Lee wants to join Keiko and pick up where they left off at the ball, but there's an important budget meeting coming up. Someone has to stay behind, and Lee does until feelings get the better of him. But when he shows up uninvited on Hataruma Island, he doesn't find the welcoming arms he hoped for. Keiko may share his feelings, but also knows there's a greater good. There's Monarch. They have to put it before their desires, and she isn't convinced they can. Just today, Lee jeopardized Monarch by skipping an important meeting to be with her. After a melancholy kiss, Lee sees what it is they came here for. A scientist developed a machine which simulates gamma radiation, which attracts titans. For all intents and purposes, a titan phone. And today when it works, they learn firsthand it'll take more than 150 pounds of uranium to kill Godzilla, because he is very much alive. When they return home, Lee agrees to keep Godzilla's reemergence a secret, because Keiko knows that if the government finds out he's still alive, they'll just build a bigger weapon and try to kill him again. Lee also finds out the consequences of his attempted romantic gesture, what they in the Navy call change in command. While Lee was on his unauthorized absence, Monarch was handed off to another officer, Lieutenant Hatch. And soon, that officer wonders if there's a need for Monarch at all. The military believes they killed Godzilla last year, and since then, Billy and Keiko haven't produced any proof of other titans out there. The officer wonders if maybe their money would be better spent on rooting out foreign spies, insinuating Dr. Mura might be one of them. At that, Billy defends his partner by taking a swing at Hatch, a partner he's falling for, and soon it's clear she is falling for him, too. Together they map out every reported monster sighting to search for some insight that will prove Monarch's worth. And one night, Billy finds it thanks to an ant. He watches the insect crawl through a hole in the map, and Billy realizes maybe that's what titans do. Maybe that's how they move around the world without being seen. He rushes to Keiko's home and shares his theory of a hidden realm beneath Earth's surface. And that's not the only revelation of the evening. Billy also meets Keiko's son, Hiroshi. It turns out that she is a widow. She's kept it secret because she already has a hard enough time getting the respect she deserves. And what would people do if they knew she was raising a child alone? Then don't do it alone, Billy offers and assures he has her back. As for their budgetary issues, Lee has their back. He goes over Lieutenant Hatch's head, directly to their superior General Puckett, and plays a card they've been keeping close to the chest. He reveals Godzilla is alive. And with that revelation, Puckett agrees that of course, Monarch must remain active. For a while, things look up for the team. Until a tragedy four years later in Kazakhstan, they find some Titan eggs at an abandoned power plant, and when Keiko tries to extract a sample of genetic material, the ground begins to collapse under them, and insectoids hatch from the eggs. Lee and Billy try to pull her up to safety, but she's just out of reach, and she falls into the swarm. By 1962, Billy has become a father to Hiroshi, and Lee an uncle. Then another tragedy strikes, Operation Hourglass. Lee is part of a small team under Billy, attempting the first ever voyage into his theorized hollow earth. Knowing the risk, he leaves a token behind for Hiroshi, his pocket knife, and the danger proves all too real. Only Titans can get through the vortex to underspace, so the plan is to use the gamma radiation simulator or Titan phone to draw one out, then follow it back in. At first, things go as planned. A Titan comes to the surface, and Lee's vessel follows it back down. Then, disaster. 
the passageway implodes, and they lose contact with the vessel. Lieutenant Puckett demands answers from Billy, but he comes up short. Lee is gone, and Billy Randa has no idea what went wrong. Then the hard part, telling Hiroshi, who lost his mother to the job, that now he's lost an uncle too. And 11 years later, he loses a father. In the time since Kazakhstan and Operation Hourglass, Bill Randa has only become more obsessed with his crusade to find monsters, and in 1973, he makes his final attempt. He's helped by geologist Houston Brooks, who wrote a paper substantiating the hollow earth theory. Although one passage to it collapsed when Lee disappeared, Bill believes there's another in a place called Skull Island. He gets approval for the expedition and brings a team with him. Brooks, monarch biologist San Lin, a military escort led by Lieutenant Colonel Preston Packard, an ex-British SAS captain with expertise in uncharted jungle terrain, James Conrad, and anti-war photographer Mason Weaver. Getting to the island means penetrating the perpetual storm that surrounds and hides it. Once they're through, they drop seismic charges to test the density of the island, and Brooks is happy to report the bedrock is practically hollow, further evidence of Randa's theory. But what they don't know is that the island is protected by Kong, and he doesn't appreciate the fine distinction between seismic charges and bombs. As exploding things fall on his island, the giant ape attacks the helicopters, and in this beast, Bill and Packard both find what they're looking for. For Bill Randa, a monster, and for Packard, a war. With America, as he sees it, abandoning the Vietnam War, he is desperate for a new enemy, and the giant ape who killed half his men will do just fine. Kong's attack scatters the group. With Bill Packard and some of his men in one, Conrad Weaver and Brooks in another, both quickly learn the ape isn't the only deadly thing on the island. There are also giant spiders, and Conrad's team learns natives though any risk of miscommunication is averted because among them is an American who can translate, World War II pilot Hank Marlowe. Since his crash in 44, he's lived among the natives, learned their ways, language, and history. He tells Conrad's group all about it, how the Iwi natives lived in fear until giant apes came to their aid, protecting them against what he calls skull crawlers, large reptilian creatures. And he tells them about the last ape standing, King Kong. Their bombs woke up a bunch of the lizards, which is why Kong was so angry. He can handle them as long as he gets to them while they're small, but there's a bigger one hiding beneath the surface who killed Kong's family. And the natives say if Kong were to fall, that big one would return. Then Conrad tells him about a refueling team coming to the north of the island in three days. If they make it there in time, they can all leave the island. They'll never make it on foot, Hank says. But he has another way, a makeshift boat built from the scraps of his and Gunpei's planes. They'd started building it until Gunpei was killed by a skull crawler. They get to work finishing the boat while the photographer Weaver has a look around. She finds a giant goat trapped under one of the downed copters and tries to help it. Kong notices her good deed and helps free the animal. When the boat is ready, Hank says farewell to the friends he made over the last three decades, and they take off. Elsewhere on the island, Bill gets the idea that Skull Island may be where the last man standing from the original monarch meets his end, so he records a message for the boy who became his son, Hiroshi, an apology for everything he took from him, and hope that he can at least leave some legacy behind, that Hiroshi will see it was all worth it. He's chased by a giant spider to the island's edge, and in desperation, tosses the bag containing his research into the water. Then another titan takes on the spider in battle, earning Bill a brief stay of execution. Soon, Conrad and the others on Hank's boat reunite with Colonel Packard's group, and they are disappointed to learn Packard has no interest in heading north to the extraction point. Instead, he wants to head west to search out a missing man. 
Chapman, who is separated from them in Kong's initial attack. The others begrudgingly follow until they reach the boneyard, containing what's left of Kong's parents, a mass grave. Hank warns it's too dangerous to cross, but there's no convincing Packard. He goes, they follow, and sure enough, a skull crawler emerges. That's how William Randa, sole survivor of the USS Lawton and last man standing of the original monarch, meets his end. And it's how Conrad finds out they're on a wild goose chase, because the monster spits a skull from its mouth, along with the dog tag of the man it belonged to, Chapman. They survive thanks to Marlowe and Conrad wielding Gunpei's sword and Weaver's ingenuity, using a lighter to ignite a gas pocket. Then Conrad shows Packard the dog tag and tells him the man they're searching for is gone. Yet the colonel insists they continue, because this was never really about finding a missing man. This was about going back to collect the weapons they need to kill Kong, to avenge his fallen soldiers. Hank tells him that'll only make things worse. Kong is the only thing protecting the island. If he dies, the big skull crawler, the one he's kept at bay, will emerge. Well, Packard insists, then we'll kill it too. When they see there's no convincing him, Conrad and the civilians leave him to go their separate ways. But when he and Weaver run into Kong himself, things change. The beast looks at Weaver, and perhaps because he saw the good she did earlier, trying to help that trapped goat, he approaches peacefully. The photographer even places a hand on him. It's then they both know, they can't abandon him or the people of this island. Packard's napalm draws Kong's attention and they follow behind. By the time they reach the makeshift war zone, Packard's managed to take the massive ape down by drawing him into the lake, then igniting napalm hidden within it. While Kong is out, the men get to work planting bombs on him, until Conrad, Weaver, and Hank arrive with their own weapons. There's no reasoning with Packard, but his men are another story and they are soon convinced that Packard's lost it. They leave him and join the others. Conrad beckons the colonel to follow, and time is of the essence because with Kong down, the big skull crawler emerges. When Conrad sees it's pointless, he leaves. And once the colonel is alone, he moves to detonate the bombs, but he's crushed under Kong's fist before he gets the chance. The rest of them take off toward the boat, but soon the fight between Kong and the lizard is upon them. The ape holds his own, until he doesn't. It doesn't look good for him, until he gets some help. Hank's boat is apparently armed, and distracts the skull crawler enough to give Kong a chance to get back up. And then, with some creative use of man's debris, he takes his enemy down with a sharp propeller on the end of a chain. In the end, the survivors make it to the rendezvous point and leave the island as Kong watches. Back home, Hank finds a wife and son waiting for him. Conrad and Weaver, on the other hand, are taken to Monarch, where they meet with Houston Brooks and San Lin. In a small interrogation room, they're told that Kong is only one of many like him, beasts who once ruled this planet. And he shows them images of cave paintings depicting Godzilla and other titans like him. In 1982, something miraculous happens. Colonel Leland Lee Lafayette Shaw III is found alive in some woods, and he hasn't aged a day. He himself only understands what happened when he sees a now-grown Hiroshi with his pocket knife. What exactly happened? In that experiment 20 years ago, he did reach that realm beneath the surface. One man died in the crash, the others were killed by a titan, and Lee himself was pulled into a vortex. Next thing he knew, he was here. It seems time passes differently in the hollow earth thanks to gravitational distortion. To Lee, he was gone a week, but on the surface, two decades passed. He tells Hiroshi that his father was right. Bill was right about everything. Two worlds, one on the surface, one beneath, and a balance between them. But after losing both parents to their theories, Hiroshi's grown bitter and assures that his father was insane. Humans lived with Titans for thousands of years just fine until the three of them, Bill, Keiko, and Lee, meddled in their world. After that, 
Hiroshi condemns Lee to forced retirement at a secure monarch facility for observation and study. A lot of nice words to avoid saying plainly that Lee is now their prisoner. Elsewhere, there is an island near Skull Island, also populated by Titans. But in the early 80s, it gains two human inhabitants, Annie and her father, who shipwreck there. Unlike Skull Island, this one isn't protected by a giant ape, so when a dog-like titan attacks, the only one to protect Annie is her father. He kills the beast, but dies himself in the process. And Annie learns the titan was also protecting someone, its own offspring, only a puppy. The two, now alone, quickly bond. She names him Dog, and they grow up together on Annie's island, which is what she's decided to call it. Life is good until 10 years later when someone comes looking for her, a woman named Irene who leads a team of mercenaries. But it isn't just a teenage girl they find, but also her friend, a giant dog who feels threatened by their presence and eats a few of them. So the mercenaries draw their guns and kidnap Annie by force, then take her aboard their ship. But a decade on an island filled with monsters has made her formidable, and she fights her way off their ship, escaping on one of their smaller boats. And they aren't the only ones on these seas. Nearby is the Once Upon a Maritime, captained by Cap. He's out there searching for monsters, because he saw one once, and the awe it inspired turned into a need to see it again or discover more like it. He's joined by his son Charlie, his friend Hero, and Hero's son Mike, along with their crew. Charlie has grown tired of his father's adventures and wants to live a normal life, go to college, meet a girl, and all that stuff. Today, he gets to do one of those things, because he finds a girl overboard, Annie. After her escape, a sea monster sank her boat. Charlie quickly rescues her, and once she wakes up, She's skeptical of this new crew, given how poorly the last one treated her. But Cap, Charlie, and the others make it clear they only want to help. And when that same squid-like titan which sank her boat sinks their ship, she returns the favor, rescuing Cap from drowning. Meanwhile, Charlie and Mike wash ashore what they soon learn is Skull Island. Cap washes ashore elsewhere on the island, but Mike's father, Hero, and the rest of the crew aren't so lucky. They disappear with the ship. The boys struggle to survive on an island filled with monsters, until Annie catches up with them, and this time she's with Dog, who managed to swim ashore. With the skills she's learned surviving on a similar island for years, she helps them fight monsters and find food. They even get to see the giant ape who protects the island in action, when he saves their lives by eating a crocodile before it could eat them. Between it all, Annie and Charlie find a few minutes to bond. She asks his age, he tells her 17, and she wonders if maybe that's how old she is too. Charlie liked her from the moment they met, and now she's starting to like him too. Though it's clear Dog, protective of the girl he grew up with, doesn't feel the same way. While Charlie and Annie become fast friends, Mike keeps to himself that he is unwell. When that squid attacked, it struck his chest and left a big wound. But he doesn't want to worry his friend, so he keeps it quiet. Meanwhile, Charlie's dad has been on an adventure of his own. He bumped into Irene, and the two struck a bargain. If she helps him find his son, he'll help her find the girl. So far, it's been impossible for her mercenaries, considering Annie's overprotective dog. But soon, they figure out a way to separate them, at the cost of one of her men. As they pass through a clearing, a giant bird swoops in and carries off one of the mercenaries. Knowing the bird's hunting grounds gives them the idea. They lure Annie there to the clearing, and just as they hoped, the bird grabs Dog as they tranquilize Annie. Meanwhile, Charlie and Mike watch it happen from behind some tall grass. When they see Charlie's dad among the mercenaries, the boys assume he's being held captive. Mike gives himself up as a distraction so Charlie can escape, but Charlie only manages to bump into a native who chases him into a clearing, then that big bird swoops in and carries him off. It drops Charlie at the top of a high tower at the foot of a temple, some kind of testament to the island's colossal ape. 
and he finds Dog. The beast is weary of the boy, but seems to calm when Charlie says Annie's name. He assures Dog they're on the same side, and together they scale down the tower. Along the way, Charlie spots carvings of the ape fighting monsters and protecting the natives, and at the bottom of the tower, he sees the ape himself, staring sadly at a medallion in his collection, until he's interrupted by a dead whale that lands in his backyard, thrown from offshore by the big squid that took down their ship. Back at camp, the wound on Mike's chest takes its toll. He's going to die unless they get off the island and get him some real medical attention. Irene gives whatever aid they can, all while dealing with a pretty annoyed Annie who isn't too happy about getting caught again. And finally, Irene confesses what's become obvious to Cap. She is Annie's mother. She tells Annie about burying an empty coffin and mourning her daughter until a fisherman spotted the wreckage of her ship. That's why she came here with her team. It's all been about finding her daughter. The only reason they drew their weapons is because they unexpectedly found Annie riding a man-eating beast, which ate some of them. When Charlie returns with Dog, the beast pounces on Irene, but after she apologizes for shooting at Annie and taking a decade to find her, Annie calls him off. Their relationship is far from repaired, but Annie does decide to stay, and that's progress. Soon, they're reminded of the thing stopping their escape. That giant squid emerges and kills another one of the mercenaries. If they try to leave, it'll do the same to the rest of them, so their only hope is to kill it first. And Charlie has an idea how. He saw something on the island capable of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the giant squid. The ape. Charlie saw those carvings, so he knows it's his job to protect the island, and that squid must want the throne but is too smart to go on land where his enemy will have the advantage, so he's been taunting him, which explains the whale he threw at him. Charlie suggests they get the ape to fight the squid. How? By sneaking into his temple and stealing the medallion he seems to care so much about, then run to the shore and hope he chases them. Once he's in range of the squid, a fight will be inevitable. Charlie has no idea what the medallion means to the ape, but he is right that it's important. It belonged to a native Kong was close with, until that squid killed her and many others. Kong buried the girl and kept the medallion as a token of remembrance. So, when Annie, Charlie, and Dog steal it, it has the desired effect. Kong chases them across the island, but Dog just isn't fast enough. Kong is closing in, until Charlie realizes that Dog is fast enough, just not with two people on his back. So, he tells Annie she's the coolest girl he ever met, then lets himself fall. And with only Annie on his back, Dog is fast enough to reach the shore. And it works. The squid attacks Kong. The ape holds his own for a bit, but he is in water, the squid's domain, and soon ends up at the ocean floor. Charlie, meanwhile, falls into a trap and ends up hanging from a tree. A native approaches, promising he will suffer for what he did to Kong. But Kong isn't dead yet, and as he struggles under the weight of the sea monster, he notices a shipwreck nearby, the Once Upon a Maritime. It proves a fine weapon as Kong bludgeons the squid into submission. He resurfaces, bloodied and exhausted, then notices Dog struggling to stay afloat in the water he displaced. He notices Annie begging him to survive, and Kong remembers the girl who left him the medallion. He couldn't save her that day, but he can save Dog. He places him safely next to Annie, who begins to apologize for taking the medallion, when the squid re-emerges. This time, Kong finishes the job. He beats the monster to a pulp, rips it in half, and throws the remains into the ocean, inadvertently causing a tidal wave, which crashes Annie into a rock. She hits her head and wakes up in a hospital two weeks later. Her mother tries to calm the girl as she looks out at the city and asks, Where am I? The following year, Skull Island claims a few more new residents. Over 20 years ago, Houston Brooks survived a harrowing visit to Skull Island. Since then, he and the few others who survived have kept the island a secret. If anyone knew it existed, a place teeming with titans, they would be tempted to meddle with it 
and deal in forces beyond their comprehension. But the island wasn't all bad. It was during that expedition when Brooks grew close with San Lin. In the years that followed, they were married and had a son named Aaron, who has followed in their footsteps, working for Monarch. One day, he breaks into his father's files and learns about Skull Island. He's horrified. An island full of monsters. What if they escape? His parents have apparently put their faith in a bigger monster named Kong to keep the island in check. When he confronts his father, Houston explains they monitor the place by satellite and everything is fine, and he warns his son to leave it be. Soon after that, Aaron disappears on a trip to Antarctica. At least that's the official story. In truth, his son gathered a small team for an off-the-books mission and, using his father's notes, found Skull Island. And just like that voyage in 73, their craft is downed seconds after reaching it. Though in their case, it isn't Kong who takes them down, but a flock of psycho-vultures. The five of them eject, while their pilot Sejudo crashes in the distance. Helen Karsten is the first to die, killed by a pack of death jackals, as the rest of them find cover in a cave. That's where the Iwi natives find them and invite the survivors back to their village. Communication is surprisingly easy because at least one of the natives speaks English. He learned it from his father, who learned it from World War II pilot Hank Marlowe. After meeting the natives, they're on the island for months, long enough for the team's mythographer Richo to learn the Iwi language and become enamored with their folklore. He also develops a strong taste for their medicine. It's not long before he's seeing things, visions of the island's past. He sees that this place was paradise for a tribe of Kong species until the skull crawlers came and laid waste to everything. He wakes from the vision and announces with religious fervor that tomorrow they will commune with Kong. They will seek him out and finally meet. The others think he's crazy, but at the same time, Kong is part of why they came here and they still haven't found their craft. So they agree to the pilgrimage in hopes of seeking out both. On the voyage, they don't find Kong, just more monsters, but they do get in range to pick up a signal from Sejudo. Their pilot is alive, and the craft can still just barely fly. They make their way there, across the boneyard which claimed Randa's life over 20 years ago, and like deja vu, they're attacked by a skull crawler. When they run for cover in a nearby cave, Richo has another vision. This time, he sees the end of Kong's tribe. A male and female make their last stand against the skull crawlers. He fights not to live, but to buy time for her to give birth. That's where Kong is born, on a battlefield, surrounded by blood, thunder, fire, and death. She sealed him here in this very cave for protection, and Kong, in the first minutes of life, watched his mother and father torn to pieces in front of him. That's the day he was born, and so too was his hatred, rage, and fury. Once the coast is clear, they head outside and find Sejudo approaching in the craft, there to pick them up so they can finally leave this island. Only Richio has no interest in leaving. So he blows up the craft. Evelyn reacts fast, but her bullet misses. Richio's doesn't. And killing two of his teammates is not where the madness ends. He is determined to commune with Kong and knows just how to do it. He blows up the walls around the Iwi village, exposing them to all the monsters around them. Aaron's final squad member is killed, and several villagers are killed. But Richio's plan works. Kong comes to the rescue. He kills every monster which has breached the walls, and then as Richio pledges fealty to his new god, the god answers by crushing him under his fist. And finally, it is not Richio, but Aaron Houston, this expedition's sole survivor, who makes the communion. He meets Kong, and after the encounter, records a message for his father, telling him about everything that happened, and telling him what he learned. Kong is not just a beast or savage brute, he's an orphan, and he has an instinct to protect human life. He's protecting all of us. Aaron has no way to escape the island, and no way to get this message to his father, so he does the best he can. He puts the recording in a Kevlar float bag and tosses it into the sea. It's a faint hope, 
but maybe one day it'll reach his father. Three years later, monarch scientists Ishiro Sirizawa and Vivian Graham are summoned to the Philippines to investigate something. A mining company found a radiation pocket and brought heavy machinery to dig for uranium, but the ground collapsed beneath them and radiation levels suddenly rose, as though contact with the outside air catalyzed something. In the cavern, the scientists find the ancient skeleton of a long-dead creature, similar to Godzilla, perhaps one of his ancestors killed by parasitic spores, and next to the bones, two of those spores, one dormant and one already hatched, part of the reaction from exposure to the surface. Whatever it hatched went looking for radiation and finds some at a nuclear power plant in Japan. Along the way, it causes strange tremors, which gets the attention of supervisor Joe Brody. As the tremors approach, he warns they might have to shut down the reactor, but of course nobody wants to hear it. So he sends someone he trusts to investigate, Sandra Brody, his wife. And within minutes, he learns that he sent her to die, because once the tremors arrive, they cause a reactor breach, and if they don't seal the corridor, the whole city will be exposed. Joe begs her to get out of there before it's too late, but they both know the truth. It already is. He seals the corridor, trapping Sandra and the team in their makeshift tomb, and through a tiny window, she begs him to be a good father. Joe promises he will, and across town, their son Ford watches the plant collapse. As one son loses a mother, elsewhere a father gains back a son. Seventeen years ago, Houston Brooks thought he lost Aaron to an ill-fated expedition in Antarctica. Today, he learns the truth, because that recording Aaron left was finally discovered, and it's just in time, because Houston is only days away from retirement. After listening to the recording and discovering his son may be alive on Skull Island, his spirits are lifted, higher than they've been in a decade. When a co-worker suggests Alaska for a retirement cruise, Brooks responds, no, not Alaska. Then he smiles and adds, someplace tropical, I think. And it turns out to be a great time for messages in a bottle, because in just the following year, a fishing boat discovers Bill Randa's bag of research too, also tossed off the edge of Skull Island. Soon, it makes its way to a safe in his son's office. The following year, 15 years after the power plant meltdown in Japan, Ford Brody has grown into a U.S. Navy officer specializing in explosive ordnance disposal. After 14 months away, he returns home to San Francisco to his wife Elle and son Sam. But it's a short-lived reunion, because apparently his crazy dad is at it again. Joe has been arrested for trespassing in the quarantine zone around the collapsed plant. Ford heads to Japan to bail him out and listens to the old man's ravings about the wife he sent to an early grave, and how to this day he doesn't know what killed her. They say natural disaster, but he knows they're hiding something, and whatever it is, a few days ago, it started talking again. The same tremors from 15 years ago, and he can prove it if he can sneak back into the quarantine zone to retrieve the data from their old home. This time, Ford comes with him. It takes no time at all for them to get caught and taken into custody at the plant, where that parasite from the Philippines has been cocooning for 15 years. Joe warns that they don't know what they're dealing with. The light flickers, and that's what he's talking about. The creature is capable of releasing an electromagnetic pulse. That's what caused the meltdown 15 years ago, and if they aren't careful, this thing could send them back to the Stone Age. The creature hatches, and it looks like a colossal insect. It leaves the plant and much collateral damage in its wake. Ford survives. His father does too, but barely. Just enough to leave his son with some last words before he passes. He tells Ford to go home to his family and to keep them safe, whatever it takes. Ford has little time to mourn, because Ishiro and Vivian could use some help. They tell Ford about the ancient creatures who fed on radiation, about Godzilla and the parasitic spore, 
which the Navy are calling MUTO, or Massive Unidentified Terrestrial Organism. The one that hatched 15 years ago came here to this plant and cocooned, feeding off radiation until it emerged into the creature they met today. Joe was right about the electromagnetic pulse, so they're wondering what else did he deduce about the creature? Ford remembers one thing. His father described the tremors as talking, which raises the question, who or what was the Muto talking to? They don't know yet, but regardless, they need to find and stop the Muto. What happens if they don't, Ford asks, and Ishiro tells him, nature has an order, a power to restore balance. He points to an image of Godzilla. I believe he is that power. Soon the team heads to Hawaii, where Ford boards a train that will take him to the airport so he can fulfill Joe's last request, go home to your family. But the trip is interrupted by the arrival of the Muto, who apparently found some food, a Russian submarine filled with nuclear materials. The creature feeds until his arrival is noticed by nature. Godzilla rises off the coast of Honolulu, inadvertently flooding the city with tidal waves. Nevertheless, he fights off the creature before returning to the water. The next day, they realize who the Muto was talking to, the other Muto, the one that hadn't hatched yet, and they're too late because by the time they check on the repository where it was kept in Nevada, they find a big hole where it must have escaped after hatching. This second Muto is bigger than the first, but wingless. It tramples its way through Vegas while Ishiro and Vivian can only watch. They deduce it must be a different sex, a female, and the signals from the male Muto were a mating call. She's been waiting in her spore for the male to reach maturity, and now that he has, they're hoping to reproduce. The Navy's tracking model places all three creatures on a trajectory for San Francisco Bay, the Mutos and Godzilla, who Ishiro deduces is hunting them. In fact, he believes humanity's best bet is to let the lizard fight this battle. We can't defeat them, but he can. The Navy disagrees. They'd rather wait for the creatures to converge, then drop a nuke on them. Though it'll be complicated. With the Muto's EMP ability, remote detonation is impossible. They'll need to use analog timers. Ford volunteers to come along to lend his bomb expertise and get home to his family in San Francisco. But it isn't that simple, because as they transport the nukes on a train, the female Muto, already carrying offspring, intercepts them and eats most of the warheads. Despite the setback, they continue on with the plan. Ford continues on toward home, where his family is already in grave danger. Elle has put their son on a bus to evacuate the city, while she waits behind, hoping for Ford's return. And that bus ends up on the Golden Gate Bridge, directly in Godzilla's path. The Navy fires their missiles, and he stands to absorb the barrage, shielding the civilians on the bridge. But as the bombs keep flying, Godzilla eventually careens through the bridge, just as Sam's bus speeds past the carnage to safety. Meanwhile, Ford and the team's second attempt at getting a nuke to the bay fails. The male Muto sets off an EMP, stopping ships and sending jets crashing from the sky, and he grabs the nuke, bringing it to the middle of the city, a nuke which has already been armed to detonate in 90 minutes. Now they have a new mission, parachute into the Muto's nest and defuse their own bomb before it goes off in the middle of San Francisco, killing thousands. They land in a city turned war zone as Godzilla meets the male Muto in battle. They avoid the fighting gods and find the nuke, surrounded by offspring preparing to hatch. There's no time to disarm the bomb, so they opt for plan B, get it as far from the city as possible. They grab it and leave, but Ford realizes something. Those eggs are going to be a problem when they hatch, so he torches them, which gets the attention of the Mutos, and it's just in time, because fighting together, they had begun to overwhelm Godzilla. The female Muto finds her burned eggs and turns toward Ford with intent to kill, but she's made a grave mistake. She left Godzilla alone. She gave him a chance to recover and unleash his atomic breath. It saves Ford's life, 
but the female Muto manages to survive too when her mate comes to her aid. She takes off after the nuke, leaving the male in a one-on-one -on -one brawl with Godzilla, a brawl the Muto promptly loses. Though the second round of battle leaves Godzilla exhausted, and he collapses under the weight of a falling skyscraper. Ford rushes after the nuke, which the team has loaded onto a boat, just before most of them are killed by the female Muto. Now it's all up to Ford. He gets on the boat and pushes off from the dock, then once again finds himself face to face with the Muto, and once again he's saved by Godzilla, who unleashes another round of atomic breath. Her body falls, and Godzilla drops her decapitated head alongside it, as he roars victoriously, before collapsing from exhaustion. Ford does the same, next to an armed nuclear warhead at five minutes from detonation. He closes his eyes, until a bright light shines above him, a rescue helicopter. It takes him to safety, while the nuke detonates far from any civilians. When the sun rises, Ford reunites with his son and wife, and Godzilla wakes. He roars to the sky before returning to sea, crowned by the public as savior of their city and king of the monsters. But G-Day, as it becomes known to the public, does not end happily for everyone, including a teacher named Kate who lost a busload of students in the attack. And that's not where the heartbreak ends. Five days later, her father, Hiroshi Randa, son of Bill and Keiko Randa, tells her to take care of her mother, there's something he has to do, and he disappears. A week later, she and her mom get a call from the state police in Fairbanks, Alaska, saying the bush plane he was on disappeared in a storm. Others were touched by the tragedy of G-Day too, including monarch scientists Emma and Mark Russell, who lost their son Andrew to Godzilla. Grief drove Mark to drinking and put a rift between them, while Emma's grief created in her a resolve to change the world so Andrew's death would not be in vain. She gets a chance when Monarch drafts her to study the emergence of a new Titan, a few months after G-Day. The new Titan first appeared in Japan. An earthquake struck, it emerged, then Godzilla sent it into retreat. The same thing happened again in Guam. As Emma investigates alongside Ishiro Vivian and a small team, it puts her on a collision course with former British Army colonel turned eco-terrorist Alan Jonah. During the quake in Guam, he managed to escape custody but left his phone behind. On it, they find a photo of a borehole in Siberia, similar to ones left behind after the Titan's emergence in Japan and Guam. At the bottom of the cavern, they find ancient egg casings, resembling the ones which hatched the Mutos in the Philippines. And they run into Jonah. He's arrested, and when they ask why he's obsessed with monsters, what is he trying to prove? Jonah answers, the monster is man. And watching Dr. Emma Russell at work, he's impressed. He wishes her safe travels and adds, be seeing you. Through a combination of scientific analysis and ancient folklore, Emma discovers the true nature of this mystery titan. In ancient times, it was called the Dragon Beetle, and if they aren't careful, it could lead to a new Dark Age. Because the Dragon Beetle could be called by a more scientific name, Muto Prime, and she is part of a violent, parasitic cycle which has killed many of Godzilla's species, including Dagon, whose bones were discovered years ago by Ishiro and Vivian in the Philippines. It works like this. Once a Muto lays their eggs, the Muto Prime injects them into a titan of Godzilla's species. Feeding on the nuclear furnace inside the giant lizard, the eggs incubate and eventually hatch. The titan is left dead, and the Mutos, like an invasive species, eradicate surrounding ecosystems. Eventually, the brood turns on itself, fighting until only the strongest Muto survives to become the next Muto Prime and start the cycle all over again. The eradication of ecosystems has led to mass extinctions and dark ages, all corroborated by historical evidence. So how do they stop it? Emma has a theory. Ancient folklore says that when the Lord of Thunder tires of drumming, 
the dragon beetle rises. Emma translates myth to science. When the Muto Prime injects the eggs, those eggs release a sonic pulse to signal they've been safely deposited. That pulse tells her the job is done, so the Muto Prime leaves. If Monarch can mimic that sonic pulse, it will trick the Muto Prime into thinking she's finished. She'll back down, making it an easy fight for Godzilla. As they prepare for the risky plan, Houston Brooks pays Emma a visit. He's worried about her. She has the same look on her face that Aaron had before he disappeared. You're pushing yourself too hard, just like he did, Houston says. Emma, I know what it's like to lose a son. You found yours, Houston, she replies, and she assures him nothing will happen to her. What about Maddie, her daughter, Houston asks, and Emma lashes back. Nothing's going to happen to her. All that's left is for him to quietly wish her good luck. But that luck doesn't get her very far, because the plan goes horribly wrong. The sonic pulses they make only turn the beast more aggressive, not less. Lives are lost, and the UN Security Council refuses to hear her out when she posits what went wrong. They didn't account for refraction. The pulses can't just be released into the air. They have to sound like they're coming from inside Godzilla. Unwilling to take further risks, the Security Council decides on the same plan Serizawa suggested in San Francisco. Let them fight. Though Serizawa and Emma both know, Godzilla is getting weaker and will likely lose the next bout with Muto Prime. So they come up with a plan B, pinning their hopes on a prototype Emma built with her husband Mark back at MIT, a sonar device meant to communicate with animals. They modify it to communicate with titans, and at the next confrontation, they activate it, and this time, with the pulse tuned to sound like it's coming from inside a giant lizard, it works. The Muto Prime backs down, and Godzilla wins the fight, saving himself and humanity in the process. The following year, Kate and her mom find something which makes them curious. A set of keys and a lease for an apartment in Tokyo, in Hiroshi's name. Kate flies over and at the apartment finds one of her father's secrets. A second family. A mother and her son, Kate's half-brother, Kentaro. This is not what she was expecting to find, and it only cements her view that her father Hiroshi was not a good man. After the tragedy of G-Day, he abandoned Kate and her mother. Now she learns that this was only the cherry on top of an affair that apparently lasted decades, something neither family knew about. In fact, they don't even know who he married or cheated on first. Despite the revelation, Kentaro defends their father and the important work he did. He brings Kate to their father's office to prove it, but she finds something else, another secret, a safe containing the research of Bill Randa, Hiroshi's father, Kentaro and Kate's grandfather. On the bag, there is a symbol, one that Kate recognizes from the outfits worn by people who were there on G-Day. It seems Monarch has something to do with Godzilla, and perhaps their father worked for them. The research is all stored on old tech they have no idea how to access. Fortunately, Kentaro knows someone who does. Unfortunately, it's his ex, May, who isn't too thrilled to see him. Nonetheless, they put their differences aside and she pulls the data for them. They find a satellite map, like one that was in Hiroshi's office, and a photo of their grandmother, Keiko Randa, standing in Godzilla's footprint. It could be the beginning of a globe-trotting adventure, but Kate isn't interested, so for her, the journey is over. She prepares to head home until she's intercepted by Tim and Michelle, agents of Monarch alerted by May cracking the encryption. She escapes their grasp, and by the time she gets to May's place, finds the agents are already there. So May and Kate sneak off together. At Kentaro's home, the boy finds a photo in his father's things of a man named Lee Shaw. His mother tells him that Hiroshi called him Uncle Lee. When the Monarch agents arrive demanding Kentaro hand over Bill's research, Kentaro's mother tells him to comply, then quietly hands him the photo of Lee, a silent message to go find him. Kentaro pretends he's going to grab the research, but instead escapes. 
he reconvenes with Kate and May. Then together, they find an older Lee at a retirement home. Though the hidden cameras and ankle bracelet tell a different story, Lee is clearly a prisoner here. He tells them that he doesn't buy the story of their father disappearing without a trace. Hiroshi is out there somewhere, alive. And if they help Lee escape this place, he can help find him. He cuts the ankle bracelet, giving them 60 seconds to decide before they are swarmed by guards. They opt for escape and begin their search in Alaska, where Hiroshi's plane went missing. And they get there with help from an old friend of Lee's in South Korea, Duho. He lends them a plane and flies with them to Alaska, where they find the wreckage of Hiroshi's plane. Inside is a body, but not his. He could still be alive. And on closer inspection, Duho realizes something else. Hiroshi's plane didn't crash. Something must have destroyed it after they landed. It's then that the Titan responsible shows itself. Duho runs back to their own plane, but the Titan releases a cold breath, freezing him and the plane solid. The others run for cover, and when May's foot lands in a cold puddle, the group is left with a new ticking clock. Find help before hypothermia kills her. But out here, where can they find help? Kentaro spotted a man-made structure when they flew in. They should head there, he insists. Unfortunately, no one else saw it. And are they willing to bet their lives that he saw what he thinks he saw? When they spot a bright light in the distance, they place their bets there instead. Kentaro, on the other hand, stands by what he saw, and rather than waste time fighting, they go their separate ways. At night, the cold is worse, so Lee lights a fire, which attracts the attention of that titan, and this time, Lee gets an idea what it's after when it takes out their flame. It's drawn to heat, which means the thing they need to keep them alive doubles as bait for the thing that wants to kill them. Lee devises a Hail Mary plan. Light the biggest fire they can to keep the monster busy, then make a break for the coast. They light that fire, and it works. The Titan does reappear, but they don't make it to the coast, because they don't have to, when Kentaro arrives with a rescue chopper. It turns out he was right. There was something out there, a place with a radio he used to call for help, and he knows Hiroshi was there before him because he left a pile of pencil shavings, the kind he always leaves behind. On the way to safety, they look over the frozen tundra and see a beam of light streaming from a hole in the ground, and they arrive at their destination, a monarch outpost where Tim greets them. They're held in custody and questioned. Michelle tries several intimidation tactics, like calling May on her lies, pointing out the various passports she carries, each for a different identity. May is clearly on the run from something, and if May helps Michelle, maybe Michelle can help her. They get nowhere, and Michelle reports to her boss, Deputy Director Verdugo, that the Randa kids don't know anything. Tim disagrees. These children could carry on Bill's legacy and help Monarch. They decide to let the kids go on a long leash and see where they lead. The next step of their investigation takes the kids to Hiroshi's other office, where they find a world map with a path drawn. Kentaro gets an idea. There was a similar map in the rescue data files which had points on it. When he projects those points onto the world map, they all land on the path, and they realize these points are the places Hiroshi is visiting along that path. There are the places he already went, San Francisco and Alaska. Then there's the place he's going next, the Sahara Desert in Africa. Meanwhile, Lee's been enjoying his interrogation at the hands of Verdugo. She gets nowhere, while he explains why he decided to escape after G-Day. Monarch had 60 years to prepare for that day, and ultimately did what they do best, nothing. The best plan they could come up with for dealing with Godzilla and the Mutos was let them fight. Lee is sick of it, and has decided where they've failed to act, he will not. His words have little effect on her, but Tim and Michelle, observing from outside the interrogation room, are another story. They begin to wonder if maybe he's right. Maybe Monarch has failed, and he could lead a better way.
During Lee's next transport, Michelle breaks him free and joins his cause. Monarch's been picking up signals all over the world that another major emergence is coming, something much bigger than G-Day. She no longer believes they will do anything to stop it, but maybe Lee Shaw can. And to her, it's personal, because she lost her sister in this war, Sandra, Joe Brody's wife. And she knows where the kids are going next, because May took her up on that offer in the interrogation room. She told Michelle where they're going, in the hopes of getting a clean slate when this is all over. Lee and Michelle find them at Kate's mom's house, and at Lee's insistence that Michelle is on their side, they all head to the Sahara Desert together, where they spot Hiroshi in the distance with a Titan phone on his pickup truck. He frantically waves for them to leave, just before Godzilla shows up. They all barely survive the encounter, and before the Titan leaves, he looks at Kate with something in his eyes, intelligence and recognition. Afterward, Hiroshi is gone, and Kate disagrees with Lee on what to do next. He insists on continuing to follow the points on Hiroshi's map. Why? Kate asks. They can't kill Godzilla. But that isn't what Lee wants to do. He wants to help Godzilla. They can come with him and he'll explain everything, or they can go their separate ways. Kate opts for the latter. But their journey is far from over. At the airport, May's past finally catches up with her. Before Kentaro met her, she went by her real name, Cora, and she worked for a company named Applied Experimental Technologies. When she discovered they were performing unethical animal experiments with cybernetic neurointerface units, she destroyed their research and went on the run. Now they've tracked her down and kidnapped her. Also, executive Brenda Holland can make a proposal. They could involve the cops and have her arrested for what she did, or she can become their spy, continuing to work with Monarch while feeding info back to AET because AET could learn some incredible things from Titans, much more than from ordinary animals. Meanwhile, when Kentaro and Kate search for their missing friend and bump into Tim, who apparently also survived the encounter with Godzilla, he wants their help finding Lee, but they refuse unless he helps them find May. They soon locate her at AET, and Tim tries to free her by setting off the citywide Titan alert system. However, Brenda can tell it's a false alarm, so she continues holding May. All Tim accomplishes is panicking the public. But it does get Brenda's attention, and she invites them in to see May, who confesses the truth to her friends about what she did, how she's been on the run, her real name, and how she gave up their location to Michelle. She also tells them she's decided to confess her crimes. She tells Brenda, no deal. She won't be their spy, even if that means going to prison for destroying their research. Outside, Tim and the kids get picked up by Verdugo and make a deal. They will help her find Lee if she can pull some strings to get May off the hook for her crimes. She does, and May walks free. Then there's the business of Tim setting off the Titan alert system. Verdugo will have to explain it to the public, but at Tim's suggestion, rather than attempt a cover-up, she decides to go public and tell the world about Monarch. At AET, Brenda receives the updated branding for their company's new name, Apex Cybernetics. Meanwhile, Lee and Michelle have begun their crusade. It turns out the points on Hiroshi's map represent passageways to the hollow earth. In Alaska, that beam of light was from one of those passageways. And that's where Lee and Michelle begin their mission, by blowing it up. At Monarch, they see the gamma rays in Alaska fell to zero, but spiked everywhere else. They have to stop Lee and Michelle from blowing up another one. If the radiation levels get pushed over the top, they could end with another G-Day. Kate, May, and Kentaro work with Tim to try and find him. They work out of an old Monarch office, the place where years ago, Bill came up with the theory of a hollow earth and Kate finds a report on Keiko Randa's death. It happened in Kazakhstan, one of the places on Hiroshi's map. Kate figures that's where Lee is heading. His crusade is partly sentimental, so he'll likely want to go where he made his greatest mistake, a place where maybe he can find redemption. They do find him there, 
well-armed and in control. He agrees to speak only to Kate, and he tells her why he's doing all this. She saw the look in Godzilla's eyes. The Titan is a thinking being who knows what he's doing. He knows there are two worlds, one for humankind and the other for Titans. Godzilla is just trying to keep them separate and safe. Lee intends to help by sealing every passageway between them. But Kate asks, what if he's making things worse? After all, Monarch's data suggests that's exactly what he's doing. Every time he closes a passageway, it spikes the gamma radiation everywhere else. But Lee won't hear it. Monarch always cherry-picks data, and this isn't about data. It's about belief and atonement. He sets the bombs to detonate in two minutes. Most of them get out, but May falls into the portal. Kate almost gets dragged in too, until Lee grabs her hand and falls into it with her before the building collapses. Kentaro wakes up in a hospital to find out his friends are gone, but he refuses to accept it and heads to his father's office in search of clues. That's where their reunion finally happens. Hiroshi shows up, wanting to speak with his son and daughter, but Kentaro tells him that he's too late. His infidelities and crusade have cost him more than he realized, because following his trail in search of answers cost Kate her life. And why has Hiroshi done all this? He's come a long way from 1982 when he told Lee that Bill Rando was crazy. After G-Day, Hiroshi became obsessed with proving his parents were right, that they did not die in vain, that there are in fact passageways leading to another realm where Titans come from. And though they don't know it yet, that's where Kate, Lee, and May are now, trapped in the same place Lee visited years earlier. Axis Monday, a place between heaven and earth, an interconnected realm between the worlds of humans and titans, a place where time moves differently. A few days trapped could mean missing decades in the world above. Lee and May find each other and search for Kate, who is alone until she finds another survivor, her grandmother, Keiko Randa, apparently alive all this time. They soon find May and Lee, but he doesn't let Keiko see him yet, because he knows the moment she does, she'll know that while to her it's only been 57 days, in truth, she's lost 56 years of her life. He'll have to tell her that Bill is gone, driven to obsession after thinking he'd lost her. He'll have to tell her that her son grew up without a mother. And soon, he does tell her all of these things, and both their hearts break. But Kate at least assures her that her son Hiroshi is okay. She knows this because Hiroshi is her father, and she is Keiko's granddaughter. After the tearful reunion, Keiko takes them to the gamma radiation simulator at her campsite, which she's reconfigured to send out an SOS signal. Something Monarch picked up, but against Tim's insistence, Verdugo has chosen to ignore it. The possibility of a survivor in the Hollow Earth is low on the priority list in the face of gamma spikes around the world, telling of a potential emergence. Monarch will not help them. So Tim quits Monarch, and instead turns to Kentaro and Hiroshi. But in that other realm, they know the longer they wait, the more time they lose. So Lee suggests they find their own way out. He asks Keiko to revert the machine back to its original configuration, to call for a Titan, and they find his old pod, the one that crashed in 1962. The plan? Leave this place the same way Lee came into it, by following a Titan. They connect the machines, make the call, and an Ion Dragon answers it. But at the last moment, a wire comes loose. Of course, Lee doesn't hesitate. He does his job, protecting the ones he loves. Outside the vessel, he moves fast, but the dragon is faster. They aren't going to make it. Until rescue, not from people or monarch, but from the king of the monsters himself, Godzilla. Lee reconnects the wire, while Godzilla takes out the dragon and tosses him into the passageway, opening a vortex. The vessel flies toward it. Lee chases after them and grabs hold of Keiko's hand, but he knows it's too much weight. He knows that he won't make it, so he lets go. Lee Shaw does not make it home, but he does find absolution, because Kate, May, and Keiko get through that portal, 
and they do make it home. Though things have changed, little time has passed for them, but on the surface, it's been two years, and in that time, Hiroshi, Tim, and Kentaro had few options for the help they needed without Monarch. In their desperation, they turned to Brenda Holland at Apex Cybernetics. That's where they are now, one of their research centers on Skull Island, and King Kong is nearby. His proximity sets off an alarm, and the group runs inside for cover. Two years later, the next G-Day will come, though the world is still recovering from the last one. Mark Russell has given up drinking, but is still estranged from Emma and their daughter Madison. Emma, on the other hand, has continued work on the prototype which saved Godzilla from Muto Prime. She calls it the Orca, and now it's sophisticated enough to communicate with all manner of Titan, even controlling their behavior. So far, it shows promise. When a Titan they call Mothra is birthed and the containment field breaks down, Emma cows her by playing an alpha frequency. But Titans are not the only thing they have to contend with. There are also people. In this case, a group of echo terrorists led by someone Emma's met before, British Army Colonel Alan Jonah. They kill anyone between them and the Orca, then take it and kidnap the one who knows how to use it. Emma, along with her daughter. Sarazawa and Graham know their best way of finding them is tracking the Orca, and they know the best way to track it is by recruiting the man who helped build it back at MIT, Mark. They show up on his doorstep and tell him what happened. In the span of one conversation, he learns Emma repurposed their machine to play God with Titans and that his daughter's been kidnapped. As they head for a monarch outpost, Mark's bad day gets worse when he learns about the 17 titans they've discovered since Godzilla's emergence, most in deep hibernation. If it were up to Mark, they'd all be executed, but Sarazawa believes that some are benevolent. He and Emma have always believed the best path forward for humanity is coexistence with titans. Mark is skeptical, but to find his family, of course, he'll cooperate. To track the Orca, they need to identify which frequencies Emma has combined to create the alpha frequency. They figured out most of it, but there's one piece they haven't been able to identify. But even without it, they figure out where it might be thanks to Godzilla. He's on the move, and Mark gets the idea that if he's leaving his territory, it's because he's looking for something something he finds threatening, maybe the Orca. Their tracking shows Godzilla heading for Antarctica, where a certain Titan is in hibernation, an apex predator which once rivaled Godzilla. They've codenamed it Monster Zero. And when they reach the base, Mark sees something he can hardly believe. Emma picks up a detonator and pushes a button to free that Titan. All this time he thought she was a hostage. In truth, She's working with Jonah, and now with help from the Orca, she's woken up Monster Zero, a three-headed dragon that spits lightning. Godzilla meets it head-on, but Monster Zero is powerful, even dodging Godzilla's atomic breath while responding with his own gravity beams. Godzilla is knocked off the ice, and during the chaos, Mark gets tangled in the wires of a downed aircraft. Dr. Vivian Graham runs back to free him at the cost of her life. She's swallowed before the rest of them escape on Monarch's massive ship, the USS Argo. In the aftermath, Emma explains herself. In the past five years, she realized something. Humanity is an infection, and Titans are the cure. Her research shows that where they go, soil is replenished, vegetation grows, and nature flourishes. By waking them all, she will hand Earth back to Mother Nature. Many will die, but those who survive will thrive in coexistence with Titans, just as humanity once did long ago, when these first gods ruled over a natural, forgotten order. Mark accuses her of meddling with forces beyond our comprehension and gambling with the lives of billions. His words do nothing to stop what happens next. Emma wakes the fire demon Rodan from a volcano near the village of Isla del Mara, condemning its residents to death. But Mark has an idea. Monster Zero is on the way. Maybe they can draw Rodan away from the island and into a brawl with the Apex Predator. 
It costs them a squadron, 12 lives, but it works. The two titans fight until Monster Zero claims victory over the Fire Demon, then turns its sights on Mark and the others on the Monarch craft. Until Godzilla gets a hold of his rival, the two alphas fight while Serizawa, Mark, and the whole crew are ordered to clear the area because the US military is about to deploy a prototype weapon, the Oxygen Destroyer, designed to kill all life forms in a two mile radius. The bomb lands and both titans fall. They check Godzilla's vitals. They are fading. As one alpha falls, another takes its place. Monster Zero rises from the water, minus one head, which it promptly grows back, and with all three heads intact, it makes a call heard around the world, proving Mark right. Emma is dealing in forces beyond her control. She hoped to wake the Titans methodically, one at a time, but Monster Zero has decided to wake them all at once. What follows is the greatest disaster in human history, monsters attack around the world in what many are calling the Rise of the Titans. Meanwhile, Serizawa and the team recuperate after their run-in with the three-headed dragon. They wonder how the monster was able to survive without oxygen. It defies the natural order. And that's it. Monster Zero is not part of Earth's natural order. Ancient folklore tells of a dragon who fell from the stars. Today, we would call it an alien creature. Back then, they called it Ghidorah. But as the world falls into chaos, there is hope. A bright light pierces the dark clouds around them, the light of Mothra, queen of the monsters. She had escaped during Jonah's attack earlier and settled under a waterfall in China to cocoon. Houston Brooks and a small team were monitoring when she emerged, but thanks to the chaos spread by Ghidorah, they'd lost contact and couldn't let the rest of Monarch know she was coming. Either way, she's here now and sends out a call to her king, and Godzilla replies. He is alive, but just barely. Maybe they can help, Mark suggests. Maybe they can find him and set off some nukes. The radiation should restore his power. And like that, Mark finds himself fighting for the life of the thing which took his son. First, they have to find Godzilla. Following Mothra's signal leads to an underwater vortex which pulls them in, and it takes them to a place most consider theoretical. Bill Randa believed in it, Houston Brooks substantiated it, Lee Shaw, Keiko Randa, and a few others have even visited its outskirts, Access Monday. But now for the first time, they go there, the Hollow Earth. Inside, they find an ancient sunken city, a place filled with statues and temples from a time when humans and titans lived symbiotically. There are drawings of Godzilla protecting the people, and inside the temple, they find Godzilla himself. It's a sight to behold. But now they have more pressing matters. The unexpected trip into a new world was a bumpy one. It fried their weapon systems. They can't launch the bomb. In seconds, Serizawa volunteers. He'll carry the bomb to Godzilla himself. Fully aware the radiation and heat outside will make it a one-way trip. He leaves the ship and minutes later puts a hand on the old god. Before the explosion takes him, Serizawa has just enough time to say goodbye to his old friend. And they aren't the only ones fighting for humanity. Back on the surface, the Titans have all simultaneously stopped their aggression all thanks to Madison. She stole the orca, took it to Fenway Park, and used the speakers to send out a calming frequency. During this temporary reprieve, Godzilla rises, ready for another round with an alien. He takes off and Mark realizes something. The missing frequency used by the orca, they thought it was another titan, but now he knows the truth. The missing piece is us. Emma combined two frequencies to create the ultimate apex predator, Godzilla and human. It's a realization that comes just in time, because Godzilla and Ghidorah are following the orca's call somewhere in Boston. With this missing piece, Mark helps them pinpoint exactly where, and then, following Serizawa's way, they will let the king of the monsters fight this battle on humanity's behalf. But this time, Mark says, 
Humanity will join the fight. Godzilla and Ghidorah battle, while people lend a hand with all the firepower they have. On the ground, Emma finally breaks from Jonah and his group. She was okay with tamping down humanity to save the natural order, but as things are going, it'll be an all-out extinction. Acceptable to Jonah, but not to her. She leaves the ex-colonel and joins Mark in searching for their daughter. They find her just as the battle takes a grim turn. Ghidorah flies Godzilla above the clouds and drops him. The king hits the ground hard. It seems Godzilla has lost this fight, except he has some help, his queen, Mothra, though she is badly wounded after a bout with Rodan, and with her remaining life, she flies above her fallen king and takes a burst of lightning from all three of Ghidorah's mouths. The queen of the monsters dies, but allows her life energy to flow into her king. It's a day for sacrifices, Vivian Graham, Ishiro Serizawa, Mothra, and now it's Emma's turn. Mark and Madison escape with the rest of Monarch's people, while she stays behind to draw Ghidorah away from Godzilla using the Orca's call. Of course, it costs Emma her life, but it gives Godzilla the moment he needs to recover. And he does. Once his radiation reaches critical mass, he treats Ghidorah to a couple rounds of thermonuclear detonation. When the explosions clear and a dragon head hangs from his mouth, Godzilla disintegrates it in a final release of atomic breath. Finally, Godzilla stands victorious as the other titans arrive and bow before their king. But while Emma may be gone, Jonah lives, and still hopes to restore the natural order, a feat he may be able to achieve with help from something they found in Mexico, something Ghidorah left behind when the military launched that oxygen destroyer, a severed head. Meanwhile, Godzilla gets back to work, patrolling his territory. First, he finds Scylla causing trouble. She's grown hungry and found something to quell her appetite. Godzilla doesn't know the word bomb, but he recognizes it as one of their things. Godzilla knows if she feeds on it, light and heat will follow, land and ocean will suffer. She ignores Godzilla's warning pulse, so they fight until she retreats. Soon, another job. Two titans in a fight over territory, a side effect of Ghidorah waking too many at once. Godzilla breaks up the fight. And when he grows tired, he seeks a place to rest. The lair he once used, the place they built for him, is gone. It's a place where they once lived with him. More recently, it's where they died for him. Godzilla may not be able to name him in his mind, but he remembers Serizawa, whose explosion destroyed Godzilla's lair, but also gave him the energy to fight Ghidorah. This is only one of many changes he has witnessed in his lifetime, and he remembers them all. But now is not the time to reminisce. He needs to find a new home, a place to bathe in the planet's warmth. So he closes his eyes, and along his spine feels the wind that blows from the heart of the planet. There are some places where the winds collect and fold, like one place long ago Godzilla might call home, were he not driven out by his rival. His energy wanes, but there is still more work to be done. He follows the smell of metal beasts and the excrement of oil, and he finds Nakika. She came to these waters seeking solace, but ended up in a net cast by them. He frees her from it and slays those who broke the natural order, those who came here not to feed or claim territory, but like the three-headed one, to destroy for the sake of destruction. He continues on toward his new home, which he's decided will be his old home, and he does sense the presence of his rival. But something isn't right. When Godzilla signals his intent, there is no reply, except an attack from another titan, Tiamat. Of course, the fight ends with her slithering away in defeat. When Godzilla finds his place to rest, he sees just what has changed in this old home in the Hollow Earth. His rival is here, but all that's left of him is a skull. From this place, Godzilla feels the other titans around the world who have pledged fealty to him, and as he lays to rest, he calls the others to do the same. Though if he knew the truth, 
his slumber might not be so peaceful, because there is at least one survivor of his rival species still out there, alive and well. He lives on a place called Skull Island, and his name is Kong. Soon, Monarch names a new head of intrastellar exploration, Corporal David Lind, and he is intent on humanity taking its next leap forward by exploring the Hollow Earth. He sends Chief Officer Dr. Houston Brooks to Skull Island, where he'll oversee a team of pilots on a mission to enter the Vortex, and explore the place where Titans came from, deeper than Access Monday, or the temple where Serizawa sacrificed his life. But it won't be easy. They'll have to cross something called the GIB, Gravitational Inversion Boundary, an electrostatic membrane separating the two realities. On top of that, there's a superstorm brewing in the Pacific. It began right after Ghidorah fled Mexico. The storm has been raging in the same spot for nearly two years, but suddenly last week, it shifted course directly for Skull Island. And that's right after the island had its first earthquakes in years, which are now becoming more frequent. Brooks wonders if they're connected. As is often the case, there are clues to be found in local folklore. An Iwi legend inscribed in hieroglyphs near the vortex says something about a darkness that will swallow the world, and a king of the deep who will rise. Exploring the island, Brooks sees Kong for the first time in nearly 50 years. The ape was only an adolescent back then. Now, he's tripled in size and become the strongest creature on the island, the only one who'd be capable of surviving the coming storm. A storm which puts pressure on Brooks and the team to begin drilling and open a hole to the vortex. If they wait much longer, the storm will overtake the island and they'll be forced to evacuate. So, they drill. They open a gateway to the vortex, and something screams from inside it. Too late, Brooks realizes their fatal error. He realizes what the Iwi legend was trying to say. The king of the deep, Kamazots, cannot stand sunlight, so in order to emerge, he needs to block the sun. He'll use the storm to do it, then emerge from the vortex to claim his new kingdom. Kamazots rises, and of course, Kong is ready to meet him in battle. For the pilots who came with Brooks, it's no longer an exploratory mission, but a combat mission. They help Kong by handling the swarm Kamazots brought up with him, while the King of Skull Island faces him directly. Soon, the battle is won by Kong, but the storm has swallowed Skull Island and will make it unsurvivable. Monarch has already begun evacuating the Iwi natives. As for Kong, Brooks checks with Dr. Eileen Andrews, a Monarch scientist who's been living on Skull Island. She's an expert on Kong and the Iwi natives. All this confirms a hypothesis of hers. Kong's status as an apex predator makes him a target for other titans, meaning if he ever leaves the island, he'll immediately become a target for Godzilla. They'll have to keep him here as long as they can. And it'll be Andrew's job, since Brooks is leaving her in charge of Monarch's outpost on Skull Island. That would seem to be the end of this expedition, until Corporal David Lind arrives himself, still intent on taking a trip into the Vortex. Brooks and Andrews warn him that it's too unstable now and dangerous, but getting to the Hollow Earth is humanity's next great leap. The more they can learn about the Titans' world, the better they can live with them in this one. David won't let anything stop him from making the journey. Two years later, something strange happens. Godzilla seems to have turned on humanity, attacking unprovoked. But if it's up to Walt Simmons, CEO of Apex Cybernetics, humanity will fight back. And to do it, they must tap into an energy source, the same one which created the Titans, the one inside the hollow Earth, which sustains it the way the sun sustains Earth's surface. Chief Technology Officer Ren Serizawa, Ishiro's son, detected it through magnetic imaging, but to reach it, they'll need help. So they visit the foremost expert on hollow Earth, 
ex-Monarch employee Dr. Nathan Lind. He's laughed at in his profession for his crazy ideas. But Simmons and Sarazawa know they aren't crazy at all. In any case, Lind has some bad news. Getting into the Hollow Earth is impossible. His brother David tried and got himself killed by the gravitational inversion which occurs at the threshold, crushed by an entire planet's worth of gravity which reversed in a split second. But with Apex's help, that won't be a problem, because they've developed a powerful craft which can withstand such a force. Now the only question is, how do they find the right entry point and the energy source? For that, Lind has a crazy idea, based on the theory of genetic memory, that all Titans share a common impulse to return to their evolutionary source. What if they could get a Titan to lead the way? Lin visits his friend and once colleague Dr. Eileen Andrews, who's been watching over Kong since Brooks left her in charge. Would she be willing to take Kong on a journey to Antarctica, where there exists an entry point to the Hollow Earth? Then let him lead the way. But she's worried. Iwi mythology tells of an ancient rivalry between Godzilla's species and Kong's. There can only be one Alpha, and if Kong leaves the island, Godzilla will sense his presence and come for him. But she is reluctantly convinced when Lind points out Kong is getting too big for captivity, and in the Hollow Earth, the place where his ancestors came from, they might find him a new home. They load Kong on a boat, and along the way, Kong is leery but calm thanks to a heavy dose of sedatives and Gia. When that storm swallowed Skull Island, many of the Iwi natives were wiped out, but she was saved by Kong, and Eileen adopted her as a daughter. Since Gia is deaf, she communicates through sign language, even to Kong, and the ape seems to understand her. But despite Gia's assurances, Kong doesn't trust the others, and isn't entirely wrong, because among them are the likes of Maya Simmons, the Apex CEO's daughter and fellow executive, who will no doubt prioritize the valuable energy source over Kong's life. Gia's bond with Kong is strong, and on that boat, Eileen, along with everyone else, learns it's even stronger than they realized, because they see that when Gia signs to Kong, he signs back. Apparently, their communication is not just one way. Soon, the sun rises, and though they've avoided his territorial waters, Godzilla picked up Kong's scent and has come to prove he's the Alpha. Of course, Kong fights back, but this round, fought in water more suited to lizards than apes, goes to the lizard. Godzilla only leaves when Kong gives up. After that, they decide to travel the rest of the way by air, and in Antarctica, Kong is hesitant, until Gia tells him what he might find in the hollow earth. Family. They follow him in, and as promised, the apex craft survive the gravitational inversion. Finally, they're there. A world beneath our own, filled with strange creatures and unseen wonders. They follow Kong to a place that once served as his ancestor's throne room. They watch him pick up a glowing axe and place it on the ground, revealing the energy source, drawing radiation from the Earth's core into the axe. It's a sight to behold for most. For Maya Simmons, it's time to grab what her father sent here for. She extracts a sample of the energy and uploads the analysis to Apex. That is the discovery of the millennium, Eileen shouts. You can't strip it for parts. At that, Maya has her men draw their weapons, which makes Kong angry, which makes him loud, drawing the attention of some hellhawks. Kong protects Eileen, Gia, and Nathan while they escape, but takes care of Simmons himself, crushing her ship in his hand. And during all that, another threat revealed itself as a blast of atomic breath put a hole in Kong's throne room. Apparently their travels in the Hollow Earth have taken them beneath Hong Kong, which happens to be where Godzilla finds himself at the moment. Why is he there? The same reason he's been surfacing lately to attack, seemingly unprovoked. A mystery Madison Russell has been unraveling with help from her friend Jonah and podcaster conspiracy theorist Bernie Hayes. They decided to investigate Godzilla's behavior because they knew the truth. He doesn't attack unprovoked, 
and all his attacks have been at Apex facilities. It's likely they are the ones who have been provoking him. Hayes had been investigating them himself from the inside as an Apex employee, so he was able to get Jonah and Madison into one of the facilities destroyed by Godzilla. They entered a secret underground area and stumbled into a shipping crate that was sent through a high-speed tunnel to Hong Kong, where they discovered a secret weapon, the thing the CEO has been hoping to power with the Hollow Earth's energy source, his very own Mecha Godzilla and they discover the retrieved Ghidorah head. Ghidorah had necks so long, the individual heads had to communicate with each other telepathically. And now Apex has tapped into that power, allowing Ren Serizawa to control Mechagodzilla telepathically. It's this rival machine's activation which provoked Godzilla and drew him to Hong Kong, where he sensed King Kong beneath the surface. The rivals fight, and the first round seems to go Kong's way, but this is the king of the monsters he's fighting, and round two is a decisive victory for Godzilla. He leaves the giant ape on the ground, barely alive. But the battle is not over, because at Apex, they've made a fatal miscalculation. Once they replicate the Hollow Earth energy based on Maya's sample and fully power Mecha Godzilla, it disconnects Serizawa and takes on a mind of its own from the remnants of Ghidorah's mind. It kills the CEO, Walt Simmons, and then goes after Godzilla himself. The robot is powerful, and alone, after an already brutal fight, Godzilla might lose. Maybe Kong could help, but Gia can feel that his heart is slowing down. He'll die soon. They could restart his heart, but for that, they'd need something powerful. And they realize they have it. The Apex Craft. It's powerful enough to get through the gravitational inversion boundary, and once they landed on Kong's chest, it proves powerful enough to restart his heart. Kong rises and joins his rival in battle against the mechanical imitation. It's a close fight, so Madison decides to tip the odds in their favor by spilling whiskey over a control panel at the Apex facility, momentarily disorienting the machine. It gives Godzilla and Kong the moment they need to claim victory. And seconds later, Kong is roaring victoriously with Mecha Godzilla's head in his hand. The machine is dead leaving only the two ancient rivals. They face each other until Kong drops his axe. For today, their fight is over, and Godzilla returns to the sea. In the aftermath, they return Kong to the Hollow Earth, his new home, where they've opened up a monarch outpost, the first of its kind in the Hollow Earth. And for now, that's where the story wraps up. But there's more on the way, and after Godzilla x Kong The New Empire, I'll be releasing a follow-up video, a retrospective on the MonsterVerse, reviewing each movie and series, including New Empire, and I'll have help from a couple of Godzilla experts who'll be making appearances in the video, Johanna and Tony from the podcast, Castzilla vs. The Pod Monster. You might also recognize them from Hack the Movies. So, stay tuned and stay subscribed.